Hello, so welcome to this uh, mini course on complete holomorphic vector fields and their singular points. So this is part of the virtual research school, geometry and dynamics of foliations. And uh, you see my email in the screen. So if you have any comments, questions, please feel free to write an email to me. I'll, I'll be glad to, to answer your questions. So the, the, the thing is that the, the, the idea of this, this course is give you some of the to, to share with you some of the results uh, we've been working on for the last years. They concern complete holomorphic vector fields. Um, and uh, so a general problem is a problem of understanding uh, holomorphic vector fields on manifolds. Uh, so given a group, given a manifold, how did this group, how does this group act on this manifold, how does it happen? So that's the general sort of questions that we're interested in. And um, more generally, we can also try to understand complete holomorphic vector fields, uh, actions of Lie groups on um, complex manifolds or analytic spaces. So that's the general setting where where we are. So where we will be working on. So uh, let me just recall some of the more more uh, the most basic definitions, the definition of a complex flow or holomorphic action of C. So we will be working with complex manifolds. So M will be a complex manifold. And recall that an action, an additive action of the complex numbers is phi here, is a holomorphic map from C times M, M into M that satisfies these two conditions. The first one says that uh, zero does not act. And the other one is that you have a compatibility with the group. So if you flow on time uh, T and then you flow on time S, it's the same thing as flowing on time S plus T. So this is uh, what an action, so this, this you can write for any group. This is what an action of uh, holomorphic action of C looks like. And an, such an action always induces a uh, a vector field just by taking so if you restrict to if you restrict your uh, your, your uh, action you fix your second variable the space variable your solution will be given by a curve and as you pass through one of uh, to a given point you will have a vector field and this in this way you will construct a vector field in your manifold okay so the vector fields that, that arise in this way are not arbitrary vector fields. These vector fields are called complete. And the main uh, subject here will be trying to understand or to, uh, to yeah, to understand what are, what are the obstructions for a vector field to be complete. So this, this drawing I'm making here is a drawing on, uh, it's, I'm making lines, so I'm thinking more of the real uh, portrait, the real face portrait, but actually what happens is, uh, okay, so uh, not yet. So uh, so this is the problem. If I have a manifold, a, hol a complex manifold, and X, a holomorphic vector field on M, so uh, is this vector field complete? Does there exist a flow inducing, inducing this vector field? So in general, the answer is no. So not, not necessarily. There are conditions, um, for example, if your, your manifold is a compact one, then you will have a holomorphic flow. But in general, the answer is no. So there's two, two enemies, two things that you have to overcome in order for the, for the vector field to be complete. The first one is uh, something that in some sense happens at infinity. So you're orbit your as you you try to follow the flow along your vector field you might leave every compact subset in finite time you might escape to infinity in finite time so this is one of the obstructions that prevents you from being complete but the other one is one condition that does not arrive for say for real vector fields and is the problem of multivaluedness so i will be talking about this multivaluedness phenomena that arise in uh, in holomorphic vector fields. So in general, the, um, the answer is no. There are two enemies, uh, incompleteness per se, and then multivaluedness. 
And the thing is that uh, the works of uh, Giulio Ravello at the, uh, in the 90s, last century, uh, show that there are some local obstructions to completeness. So this multivaluedness uh, manifests itself locally in, in vector fields. And the idea is that if we understand these local obstructions, we can make, in some sense, a uh, local study of complete vector fields. So understanding what happens at infinity might be difficult, but understanding what happens concretely in a neighborhood of a point of a uh, uh, close set in a, in a manifold, that uh, might turn out to be simpler. So I will be reviewing some, many of the results uh, by Julio Rebello uh, in order uh, to show you how these local, local obstructions work. And there are many results that we've that have been uh, 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 obtained using this this uh, philosophy of trying to understand global actions locally. So let me just write you. Uh, an example of um, of results. So uh, we have been able, uh, in collaboration with uh, Giulio Rebello, this is uh, the first item of this slide, to extend some of Brunella's results on complete uh, polynomial vector fields in C2. Uh, we, we can extend them, for example, to vector fields on complete vector fields on affine surfaces, and even a bigger class, some semi-complete vector fields in our manifolds. Uh, for example, the early results of uh, Etienne Gis and Julio Rebello were, were used by Adlowski, Klaus, and Thoma to finish the classification of compact complex surfaces admitting vector fields. Uh, using, again, this philosophy of trying to understand locally global uh, vector fields, or more generally, actions of lead groups, we have come to understand uh, facts about the actions of SL2C on compact complex complex threefolds, and also, for example, uh, work of uh, Rebello, Re Rebello, Reis, and Ferreira, uh, we have come to understand better the holomorphic actions of uh, C2 on complex surfaces. So just, so this, I, I'm not being precise, so let me be precise, let me give you uh, a precise statement that shows you some of the philosophy here. So we have, uh, this, in the setting, we have uh, V, a two-dimensional time space. So uh, a space that embeds probably with singularities into some uh, Cn. And suppose that you have a complete holomorphic vector field on it. So we want to understand how, what, what are the, what, what can we say about both the vector field and the space about, from this hypothesis? So suppose we are in this setting, we have a Stein space, and we have a holomorphic vector field, and we have a, uh, a point in your space that is an isolated zero of x. So uh, the zeros of x form a sub-variety, and they can pass either pass through p or not pass through p. And I'm saying here that the hypothesis that, is that the zeros of x do not pass through p. So under this hypothesis, Either your point P is a regular point of V of your space and the vector field is non-degenerate, or uh, maybe uh, P is a singular point of V, and in this case, you have two, two, two possibilities. The first one is that P is uh, the way a weighted homogeneous singularity. For example, uh, say uh, V is given by, say, X squared plus Y squared plus C squared, and uh, your vector field is a radial vector field, uh, is x uh, i d over d x i. So this is one possibility. So you have a, a singular point in zero, and you have a homotopy that uh, generates. So this would be for p equals zero. This is one possibility. And the other possibility is that, uh, in fact, v is obtained, at least locally, as the quotient of C2 under some linear group, finite cyclic group of transformations, and uh, your vector field is obtained as the vector field uh, arising uh, in a neighborhood of the origin in C2 and the quotient. So I, I will come back. I will. I my my idea. So I will 
not say more about this statement. We will come back to it later. And I would like to, to use this, this statement to, uh, to come back. I will give a proof of some parts of this statement. Uh, and that would be my, my, my goal here. Okay, so, so this is the setting. Uh, the idea is try to understand global actions of C, try to understand holomorphic flows, see what the local study can tell you. Okay, so let me just go back to go start from the beginning. So uh, in a manifold, you have a vector field, you can always uh, consider it in a chart. So I will use this notation of derivations, vector fields. So if you want, you have a vector field, and if you want to integrate it, you just need to solve this system of differential equations. Both are equivalent here in manifold for dimension n. And then you have Cauchy's theorem on the uh, existence and uniqueness of solutions. It says that if you have a point in M, that's an initial condition, we will find an open subset of C, U, containing zero, and a uh, solution to the equation defined in this, uh, defined in this set, U. Okay, so U, you do not, so the, the theorem does not guarantee what the form of this U is. Uh, but what it says is that the germ of U is unique. So if you have two uh, open sets and you have solutions defining these two open sets, then they coincide in some neighborhood of zero. So this is what the theorem of Cauchy tells you. And uh, so the problem is trying to understand how big this set U can be. So that's uh, that's the the problem uh, we wish to to understand. So this is basic facts about vector fields on manifolds. Okay, so in when you have a vector field, uh, it, it always induces a foliation by curves in the ambient manifold. So, so, so let me just make a drawing. So I will, so the, the integral curves of your vector field in a manifold will be uh, surfaces from the real point of view and so you have a, a foliation, you have the composition of your manifold into surfaces. And you will have, of course, some singular points, some zeros. I will not try, if I, if I were to make a real drawing of what these singularities look like, they might look like this. So here I'm making one dimensional images, but in general, I will make uh, these sort of drawings. So the orbits are real surfaces, and then there are some singular points. And uh, I will not, so if I have a singular point, uh, a point where the vector field vanishes, zero of the vector field, there the solutions uh, are very easily described. You just map the whole C to constant to this point. These are stationary points. And so what's interesting is it's what happens on these vector fields, on these integral curves. So these integral curves come together with a vector field, okay? There's, you can restrict the vector field here. And this gives rise to this. So this is, I have a vector field, I have a more than a foliation. What I have is a foliation endowed with some geometry. So I can talk about three uh, equivalent uh, data. So I have a complex curve. So let me just Look, I, I previously said that the vector field divides the foliation, the, the vector field divides the manifold into, into, into leaves. So let me just think about one of these leaves and restrict the vector fields to it. So I can consider, consider several things. One of them is just what I said. I have a curve, a complex curve, and I see a holomorphic vector fields without zeros, just like the one I, I, I showed you before. So this is one of the thing. And then equivalently, one may consider a, uh, a, a form that is adapted to the vector field in this sense, in the sense that when you evaluate your one form uh, to the, on the vector field, it gives you the constant one. So these two things are equivalent. You can go from the vector field to the form and vice versa. And the third thing that you can attach to it, all, all these data will be equivalent is a translation structure on L. This means I, on L, your, your leaf, 
So I have, let me just draw again the leaf. Let me draw here. Uh, I have a complex line, complex numbers. So, and if I have a, a solution to my differential equation, I will write it. I parameterize some disk in my leaf. And maybe I have another solution that parameterizing probably uh, an overlapping disk. And the thing is that uh, a vector field as a differential equation gives you a autonomous equation. This is if phi if a, is a solution of your equation, phi of t plus c is a solution as well. And in fact, if you have two overlapping solutions, it turns out that what you have from uh, your change, you can think about not the parameterizations of the solutions, but rather the inverses of these solutions. I mean, locally, they make sense. And if you take this as charts of your leaf, it turns out that the difference between these two charts, the change of coordinates, is given by a translation. Okay, so in this way, you can build a translation structure on L. And that's what I mean in this point here. So if you have a solution to your differential equation, the inverse is a chart of this translation structure. And the fact is that the differential equation is autonomous tells you that this works, that this actually changes of coordinates are given by translation. Equivalently, equivalently uh, these charts of the translation structure are given by uh, the integration of your form omega, this time form, I will, I will tell. Okay, so this is, these are three equivalent uh, ways. So the geometry induced by a nowhere vanishing vector field on a holomorphic curve uh, can be understood either through the vector field or by the uh, time form, the dual form, or through this translation structure. Okay, so let so the idea is that I would like to make precise the um, the idea that the solutions of a vector field on a curve are not multi-valued; that they are single-valued. Uh, so these ideas are are um, start with uh, very very uh, with the from the moment we started the, talking about differential equations in the complex domain. But uh, sometimes so, um, a precise definition was given by uh, first by Palais in the context of uh, Lie groups acting on manifolds, and then uh, Giulio Rebello uh, made a, a equivalent discovered the same phenomena for uh, holomorphic vector fields. So I would like to talk about the definition of this, uh, so this, this, there are two ways to, I will use these names. So univalent is uh, Palais terminology, semi-complete is Rebello's terminology, and I would like to give you four equivalent definitions of what a uh, semi-complete vector field on a curve is. Okay, so let me, so the general setting is, is L, a complex curve, X, and now we're vanishing holomorphic vector fields on, on L, and the first condition is so I have I, I will draw the, make this drawing several times. So I have my L. This is my integral curve of my vector field, and then I have somewhere in C. I have uh, here I have uh, the complex plane, and I have in a, in some domain U here. Suppose that I have a solution of my differential equation. I have this parameterization of the vector field. Okay, so this is what Cauchy's, so I have this U here. This is uh, what, um, so Cauchy theorem, that's what it tells us. But uh, what, does, what would it mean for the solution to be multivalued? It means that probably I can take one curve leading to this point, say P, and then I can take another curve, I don't know how, another one leading to the same point, P, a different curve, and probably I have an analytic continuation along the first curve, and of, of this function, this function, uh, the solution phi, and maybe the uh, analytic continuations along these two uh, paths are different. That would give you something multivalued. 
So my first criteria for uh, my first definition for uh, semi-completeness for single valuedness says that for every solution phi as in the image and for uh, of my vector field and every pair of paths that lead to the same point and such that I can have analytic continuations along both of them, they define the same germ at the end point. Okay, so uh, this is my first definition, is the most natural definition. What, what the germ of is, is, so is the solution multivalued? If I can witness this multivaluedness, along the analytic continuation of the curves giving at the same time. So in this setting, if the analytic continuations were different, then I would have two values for the function at P. Okay, so this is the first condition. So if this first condition is fulfilled, then I can draw, uh, I can have a max, I can just think about the all the points as, as to which I can arrive, all the points P where I can arrive, so I will have some domain that I'm painting here in orange that I might call omega. And this will be the maximum domain of definition of my solution. So the thing, so what happens is that I cannot go beyond the boundary of this. I cannot go beyond omega. This omega will be the maximal set where the solution is defined. And a way to say of saying that this maximal set of the solution is defined is that if I have a sequence of points in this orange domain escaping from every compact subset of it. So it means that either it tends to infinity within C, it, either it escapes every compact subset of C while remaining on this maximal set of omega, or maybe it this sequence uh, arrives to the boundary of omega, but saying that it saying that uh, we do not have an analytic continuation means that if I follow the solution along this, uh, if I take the image of this sequence of points, it will escape to infinity also along the leaf. So this is what it means. So, so if this condition one is satisfied, then I can have some domain omega. And uh, this is what I'm writing here. So this is the second definition. There exists some domain omega within the, the, the complex plane and a solution such that uh, this map phi 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 hat is a proper one. So that uh, if I escape from if I escape from every compact subset in omega, either I escape to infinity within C, or the image under phi escapes to infinity. So this will be the second the second solution. And you see. So this is the second condition, uh, and we just show that the first condition implies the second one. So if we have the second condition, then you see, I, I claim that in this case, phi, this phi is necessarily a covering map. So it is already a local diffeomorphism. It, it is given by, by, by the solutions. So the only problem would be to, to know if paths may be lifted. So in fact, if I cannot, so if I take a path, this, pink path here, and I try to lift it, then see, if, if I cannot lift it with an omega, so you know, this path is a path along which the, say, the time form has, has some definite, uh, the integral has some definite value. So this path cannot go to infinity. So if I cannot lift it, it's because it hits the boundary of omega at some finite point of C. This is the condition for it not being, so this is what happens if I cannot lift my path. But see, this violates the condition that I said that the map was proper because if I can, I have, I cannot lift the path. So I, I don't know what happens here. However, the image does not escape from this compact subset. It, 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 it if I cannot, so if I can only lift the path say up to here, then, uh, I can only leave the path up to this point, and then this would violate the fact that this map phi, this map phi hat was pro a proper one. So this is our third condition for univalence, is that you have what, uh, omega, as I showed in the drawing, the, the orange uh, domain, and a covering map that is 
what, what we showed before, a map with trans between curves with translation structures. No, that's just what we showed in the previous slide. So because when I, uh, so I, I, to show that uh, the previous condition implies this third one, we already show that it's a covering map. And the thing is that the group of deck transformations has to map, uh, has to preserve these translation structures. Okay, so, so that gives you uh, the whole covering map. So the deck say I, as I would say in another way, the group of deck transformations acting in omega acts by translations. Okay, so this is the third condition. And then this third condition implies this fourth condition. Let me tell you what it is. So this third condition says that if I have a path gamma here in my integral curve, gamma, and this path has different endpoints, say this is one point P and this is another one point, another point Q, then the integral of the time form I'm labeling dt here is different from zero. Okay, so the time form measures the time uh, that I take to go from one point to another along a given path. And one say one, one way of saying that you do not have multivalidness is that you take a definite time to go from one point to another, a definite not zero time to go from one point to another. So let me show you how this so how the last condition. The, the last condition was the condition of this phi being a covering map. Uh, let me show you how this implies this fourth condition that the integral on the, of the time form along open paths is never zero. So I have, to, I have uh, this map, this uh, path gamma, and I can lift it. So I lift it. So imagine that the, 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 imagine that the integral of the time form was zero. So the time form here is just given by dz, the time form is c. So when I pull back, if, if the integral of this time form along gamma is zero, then I will go back to a closed curve. So this will be closed if the integral of the time form is zero. But if the integral of the time form is zero, then when I take the image again of phi of this lift of gamma, I, it will be mapped to, of course, a closed curve because phi is defined in all of omega. So if the integral of the time form is zero, the path must be closed. Okay, so this is the fourth condition. And you can we can see that it's easy to see that this fourth condition implies the first one. And this one will be very helpful because it will be a way to test, it's a, it's a, it's a definite test for multivalueness. If I can find you a path, along an open path along which the integral of the time form is zero, then definitely your vector field is not semi-complete. Okay, so I have, I have given you four uh, equivalent uh, uh, definitions, four equivalent, so four equivalent conditions, and if your vector field on your curve satisfies any or all of these properties, I will say that X is univalent or semi-complete. Okay, this is the definition of uh, semi-completeness in curves. So let me come to the definition of semi-completeness in manifolds. Okay, this is, this is, this, this is it will be a very, uh, so once we know what a semi-complete vector field on a curve is, if you have a manifold and you have a holomorphic vector field on M, uh, you have a foliation, you have some singularities, and then in the complement, you would have uh, your manifold realizes the union of curves. And I will say that uh, X is a semi-complete vector field if every leaf of M uh, away from the singular set of X, uh, the geometry induced by the vector field satisfies any of the previous conditions. This for every leaf of L. So this is a definition of uh, Palais under the name of univalence, again, or Revello under the name of semi-completeness. So this is what a semi-complete vector field is. Okay, so um, let me tell you some properties. Oh, so first, so you know, a complete vector field is one where, uh, so I forgot to tell you this about when I was talking about uh, 
semi-completeness in, in curves. So if you have a complete a complete vector field, it means that it, the solution might may be defined for all time. So in this case, your omega will be, in the previous slides, will be just the whole C, the whole complex plane. So this condition of uh, properness will be satisfied for free because the only way to escape from every compact subset of C is just to escape from every compact subset of C. Okay, so complete, if your vector field is complete, it will be semi-complete. So this is, uh, if you have a semi-complete, if you have a complete vector field on your manifold, it comes with an act from an action. So let me tell you what the the uh, the object corresponding to an action is when you have a semi-complete vector field. So what we will have is the following. So if you have uh, a semi-complete vector field, as I said before, if if on every leaf the geometry is has satisfies any of these properties we talked about. So we will find some omega in C times M. So for an action, this will be just the whole of C times M. But here it will be just, it will only be some open subset containing this set zero times M. And just a map phi from this omega into M, satisfying, well, the first condition of an action that zero does not flow. The second condition of an action will be we have to state it in a more restricted way. So imagine that I can flow in time s. Imagine that the flow of p in time s is well defined. And so I arrive at some point phi of s p. And imagine that I can also flow from the point phi of s p, I can flow in time t. Imagine that I can do that. And imagine also that from p, I can flow in time t plus s. If this happens, well, then these two things should better agree. Okay, so, so this is a, a restricted way in which uh, this uh, property of an action still holds. So, and then we would have to say more things about uh, the, the maximality that we just talked about. So how is this omega built? It would, this omega will be just built by gluing together all the slices, all the omegas uh, for each uh, initial condition. We will have just a solution omega, uh, and this big omega will be defined as the gluing of all of these. So uh, this condition tells me what happens if I restrict just, uh, if I fix a P, I fix a P and then I look at all the all the times where this P might flow, this will give you one domain, omega P. And uh, what I'm saying is that the third, con the third condition that this uh, semi-global flow will satisfy is that this map is the same map we saw before, is a proper one. Okay, so, so this is, uh, and of course, the condition for the vector field for the action to induce my vector field. Okay, so this is uh, semi-global flow in the terminology of, of Rebelo or a maximal local action, the terminology of Palais. And the, so this is uh, another uh, property. If you have a semi-complete vector field in the way, as we said before, uh, we can be able to build this semi-global flow well, just by gluing together all the solutions. And in fact, you can take this as a definition. If you have... Uh, a partial action as this one, uh, that, and a vector field, and it induces a vector field. Then, by definition, this will this well. Then you can show that this vector field is semi-complete, and that this is actually a definition. Okay, so so uh, some time has passed, and we are, we are we are um, we now have the definition of what a semi-complete vector field is. Okay, so complete. So some properties. Let me tell you about some properties of complete vector of semi-complete vector fields. So they form a class, a very nice class. It's a class that contains complete vector fields. It's a class that um, this it, 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 the property of semi-completeness can be restricted. So if you have a semi-complete vector field and you restrict it to an open subset of the manifold, if your open set is invariant, you will still have an, uh, if you start with a complete vector field and you restrict it to an invariant, 
open subset, you will still have an action. But if you not, do not restrict it to an invariant subset, you will still have a semi-complete vector field. And you have a semi-complete vector field, and you restrict it, you will still have such a vector field. Uh, and in fact, you can do this up to the limit. You can speak of germs of semi-complete vector fields. So this allows for uh, the study of germs. So it makes sense in, in, in this setting to study germs of complete vector fields. Okay. And this is a class that is, is well behaved. So in a given manifold, complex manifold, if you give the space of uh, vector fields, the topology of uniform convergence in compact subsets, then you can see uh, that the space of my complete vector fields is a closed one. So there are examples, for example, of sequences of vector fields and or manifolds, maybe in C2, uh, that converge to vector fields that converge to vector fields that are not complete. The space of complete vector fields is not a closed one, but uh, the limit will, will be complete. So um, what I told you is a, is a statement by Gis and Rebello, but in fact, these ideas are, are very old. Uh, Poincaré has some, some, some results in this, in, in, this, in this direction that were used. So, so, so one thing I didn't say here is, of course, we're dealing with complex differential equations, and there's a huge uh, body of work on complex differential equations in the 19th, uh, 20th century, uh, many, many important names. And also uh, this problem of uh, understanding multivalueness is a problem that was tackled by some of the ancient uh, uh, mathematicians, mo most notably uh, Anne Levy. So, uh, so we inevitably, we have, we have uh, along this, this uh, results, uh, along the discovery of some of the results I will tell you about, we have discovered many things and, and then uh, some of those things we have discovered that they were discovered and well known and well used by uh, 19th century mathematicians. Okay, so let me just give you a, uh, a particular case of this, this uh, closeness of the space of my complete vector fields. So suppose I have a manifold M and I have a family of vector fields depending continuously on some parameter alpha. And suppose that X alpha is semi-complete for alpha different from zero. I would like to prove that X zero is also semi-complete. So suppose that your vector field X zero is not semi-complete. So I have here X zero and the vector field is zero. There's some leaf here. And I have a path along this curve x0, along which the integral is path gamma. And I have that the integral of the time form uh, along this curve gamma with, that has open paths is 0. So this will mean that x0 is, x is not semi-complete. OK, so, so, suppose, so suppose that, uh, so let me in this direction that alpha varies. And let me just choose one. Uh, so suppose that the, the, the space where alpha lives is a manifold, for example, and take a transversal to this manifolds, okay, uh, along the starting at the begin the, the starting point of gamma. And suppose that you have uh, sufficiently closed. So this is the, the, the slice x zero. And let me choose another. Uh, X alpha pretty close, so I will have a, 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 this orbit that I'm drawing is a draw. It's a curve. It's an integral curve of X alpha, and then I can just try to lift gamma to the, the the neighboring leaf, and I can do this in such a way. So this gamma is is the integral of its time form is zero. So I can say that it is parametrized when I take a parametrization of uh, it is parametrized in some sense by a, by a closed curve in C. So I can take this curve that parametrizes gamma at the level zero, and I can use it also to parametrize this curve. So this will give you me a lift of this gamma to a neighboring curve. And since uh, the vector field will change continuously with alpha, and I have another integral curve that is just essentially just displaced alpha, and alpha is not a closed curve, then the curve, the different curve, the, the curve that is on the level x alpha, if alpha is small enough, will also be not closed. 
Okay, so uh, this means that x alpha, if x zero is not semi-complete, x alpha cannot be semi-complete, and this this shows you that this space is closed. Okay, so uh, this is the the closeness of the space of uh, semi-complete vector fields. Okay, and probably this is a good place to stop for this first session. So, so in this first session, we saw uh, we saw this equivalent definitions of what a semi-complete vector field is on a curve. We saw that this notion uh, um, once is a notion that happens on a leaf by leaf basis. So, a semi-complete vector field in a manifold, uh, a vector field in a manifold will be semi-complete if it is in restriction to all of its integral curves. And we started seeing some very elementary properties. This Closeness is one of them, and we will see what happens in um, in uh, in the small dimensions in the next lecture. Okay, so I don't know if you have any questions. Uh, if not, well, uh, tune in to the next lecture.